And yet, that constitution is so unpopular in Quebec that no Quebec premier has ever signed it. Now, that's just, in a way, that's just peculiar, right? It doesn't have any effect. There's no requirement that the provinces sign it. The provinces didn't make the constitution either. Nobody made it, or rather, it was made as a backroom deal. And that's why it can only be amended as a backroom deal, and that's not the Canadian way. And I would defy even the most Joe Clark worshipping member of the Canadian Laurentian elite to tell me that this is the Canadian way, backroom deals. And I have this uh, demonstration here. This is how you amend the American Constitution. One clause, 143 words, 37 of them lapsed because they were putting a fence around the horrifying institution of racial slavery. So that leaves 106 words in which Congress, by two-thirds vote of both houses, sends it to the states where you need ratification by three-quarters of the states. Things are sent to the people. And the result of that, when they decided they wanted to popularly elect senators, which they were not doing, originally senators were chosen by the state legislatures because their Senate, too, was a very meant to be a body that empowered the regions and the constituent parts of the American Federation. There it is, in 1913. Wise or foolish, the 17th Amendment was passed very simply. That's all there is to it. Here's our amending formula. Whoops. Here's our amending formula. <laughs> okay. Are you kidding me? Nobody knows what it means, not even the Supreme Court. Parts of it contradict other parts of it. It's gibberish, but I'll tell you what's not in there. The people aren't in there. There is nothing there that says an important decision about the rules under which the Canadians are going to live ought to be run by them. For their consent, and as yes, I, fl I flipped. There's your result. <laughs> is this the best Canada can do? I refuse to believe it. I absolutely refuse to believe it. He looks happy. Exactly. And when he's happy, nobody's happy. The, all of this, the exclusion of the people in 1982, is the biggest fault of that Constitution, and. It didn't address any of the problems that were gathering, and there were considerable problems gathering before 1982. The withering of the legislature, the growing helplessness of the provinces, the excessive size of government. The 82 Constitution didn't address any of that, and it didn't include property rights. People wanted property rights, but the elite didn't, so out they went. Same thing with the Charlottetown Accord, which was Finally, they were cornered. They were forced to put something to a referendum. People tell you it's not the Canadian way to have a constitutional referendum. You say, what about the Charlottetown Accord? The elite cooked up a deal. It wasn't what we wanted, and we spiked it. It was turned down in region after region of the country. It was rejected by aboriginals. It was rejected by non-aboriginals. It was rejected by virtually every significant component of the body politic. And now they say, we don't dare do it again. Well, I dare do it again. Because I want a constitution that isn't contrary to the interests or the heritage of Canadians. And if we do that, we can pass it. And we're going to leave the door open, it swings both ways. Every one of my prospective provinces in which a majority votes for it is in the New Dominion. And those that don't, they're not in. They can join, we'll always welcome you. But if a few bits of Quebec want to stay outside and see how it feels, okay. Let's learn by experience. Right? You know, you bang your head, you learn to duck next time. But no coercion. If they really don't want to be part of it, why would we... You can't drag a person to paradise and change, nor can you drag them to satisfaction in politics. But we can run the affairs of the country properly amongst those regions that do want to be part of this project. This can work, especially if somebody bumbles into a crisis and makes it happen for us. Now, it's going to take alert citizens, it's going to take alert legislators. There's no free liberty. But a con it, even when you have the people who think the right way, I have this quotation from, uh, oh yes, pardon me, I forgot a section I've got to talk about. The notwithstanding clause was mentioned. But the, the notwithstanding clause in section 33 that says that Parliament can suspend provisions of key rights but not secondary ludicrous ones periodically was put in the Constitution by premiers who were trying to save the old British system. They wanted Parliament to be sovereign because they saw the danger of giving judges the power to override elected legislators in a Constitution that didn't come from the people. And we have seen that there was a certain wisdom in what they were saying. But their, their solution was not to give you rights with one hand and take them away without the other was the wrong answer. 
The Constitution had to come from the people and be amendable by the people. So if the judges found rights that we didn't think were rights, we could amend the Constitution and say, that's not in there. And the real lethal bolt hole is not the notwithstanding clause, which has been very feeble in its impact anyway. It's this, section one, the first thing it says in the charter is that you don't have the rights in the charter. And if that isn't a con job brewing, I wouldn't know what one looks like. The right, it guarantees the rights and freedom set out in it, subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. Well, justified to who? Unelected judges, that's who. And if you don't like what they say, you appeal to them. And they say, sorry, we're right. <laughs> time and time and time again, they say, yes, it infringes your rights, but under section one, it's justified because we think so. The Chief Justice, she said, when I look at an issue, I try and decide what's good for society. She doesn't say I try and figure out what's in the law. She doesn't say I try and figure out what natural rights says. She said I try and figure out what's good for society. I am the chief social engineer, and who's going to stop me? And James I would know exactly what she meant. But James I was a bad king. So this is out. In a free and democratic society, you can't have your rights taken away. There is no clause one in our Charter of Rights. Because that sort of thing is just jiggery-pokery. Now, this is the thing I was going to quote. It's from an American uh, jurist with the ridiculous name of Learned Hand. I don't know where, how you get the name Learned Hand. <laughs> uh, I've got a question. Uh -huh. on, your, on your previous slide, how, how would you justify putting someone in jail if we didn't have those couple of uh, phrases in that paragraph? Well, the same way that you always have. If they are convicted by the judgment of their peers according to the law of the land of a criminal offense that is created by the people through their representatives, then they go to jail because they've used force or fraud. They have deprived others of their natural rights. And when you do that, you become an enemy of society and you are contained and you are punished. It's in Magna Carta, it's good enough for me. But that must be through due process and the judgment of their peers. No more administrative penalties. Well, the lawyers are already making a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> if, if it was changed and tightened up and, uh, the rule of the land, would that change the whole thing? Would that change the whole thing? Would that change the whole thing? It would depend what the law of the land looked like. As you may know, the, the Canadian Income Tax Act is over 3,000 pages long, and we owe Mr. Harper and Company some 600 of those pages. You know, a 3,000 page act means lawyers are going to be rich. We could certainly make the law simpler. And I would like to see far less of our rulemaking done by, leg by regulation. I'm not quite sure what to do about that. That's part of the, what I haven't settled in my mind, because you can't actually say everything has to be a statute. But I sure miss the days when everything was a statute, because government could do a lot less. You look at 18th century legislation in Britain, there's a fair bit of it. But most of it is what we would now consider regulation. It's very small, dealing with very specific issues and problems. There aren't omnibus bills projecting grand changes in how we live. But as Learned Hand said, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. It has to start with us, it has to finish with us. We need legislators who are devoted to liberty and alert to their duties. But if we can get these things, and I think the worse government performs, the more chance there is of getting people to, interested in their heritage and in what made this country great, the better it will work if we give them an instrument suited to the task. And the Canadian Constitution had a lot that was right in 1867, but it contained a lot that was becoming problematic. And when it was revised in 1982, none of the problems were fixed, a lot of them were made worse, and a bunch of new ones were introduced. That, in that sense, is Trudeau Sr.'s problem, because he somehow conjured up a moment and then did all the wrong things with it. But it's going to become, as I said, Trudeau Jr.'s problem because he's the Prime Minister. And he's the Prime Minister at a time when a lot of the dissatisfaction with government and the malfunctioning of government is liable to come to a head with dramatic suddenness. And the, it will be very easy at this point to provoke a crisis between Quebec and the West. And if ever I saw a man who was ready for the occasion, it's our current Prime Minister. But even if he governs better than I anticipate, the whole structure is coming apart at the seams. The fiscal position of government is so powerless. What you think it's like is not anything like what it's really like. 
in all kinds of ways. And some of you may know, my brother is head of the C.D. Howe Institute, and they have been ringing the alarm bell for years over unfunded pensions within the public sector, which amount to tens and tens of billions of dollars. You throw those onto the government debt, you get a rise in interest rates. There are so many ways that things can become problematic in a hurry, and then we have this fundamental machinery that doesn't work and that we do not trust. So, yeah, it's a huge project, but my attitude is if, if I'm not going to be tilting at windmills, why do I have this lance? <laughs> this is work worth doing. This is a crisis that needs addressing. And if you wonder why us, well, because we are here, right? We happen to be the people who are gathered to talk about this, and every movement, good or bad, starts with a small group of people who didn't care that it was obviously impossible because they knew it was right. And that's us. So let's make this happen. What else are we in public affairs for if not to make a big difference in the right kind of way? And let's be happy about it. There was a brief discussion about our language. You know what? Before you get to changing your language, change your facial expression. Because if you look really mad and beaten and sour, you know what? You're not going to convince people. And as I say, if you have to let off steam, you know, go into your garage or have a couple of beers and discuss it with your spouse if there's any person who enjoys those discussions. Fine, you know? Get it out of your system. Put it on Facebook. But then get out there. Uh, no. You know, some people think the internet's like tequila, and nothing that makes you invisible. It doesn't work that way. We need to be happy about this, and we need to look happy about it. To tell people this is a great adventure. And we know it's silly, but we don't care that it's silly, because we're going to turn silly into serious here, and it's not going to stop being fun. We have a great story. We have the real heroes of the past, the Edward Cooks, the Simone de Montforts, the William Lenthal's. These are the people who've made freedom what it was and have made Canada prosperous, dynamic, and strong. This is our heritage, and this is also the foundation on which we can build a really good future. So, let's do it. As one last thing from Blackstone, he said, The common law of England has fared like other venerable edifices of antiquity, which rash and inexperienced workmen have ventured to new dress and refine with all the rage of modern improvement. So this idiocy about novelty and change was already old hat in the 18th century, okay? Been there, done that, got the lace frock or whatever he was wearing. There's no need to be obsessed with novelty for 300 years. It's boring. It's been done. Your great, great, great grandparents were obsessed with novelty. Let's get obsessed with tradition. That would really be different. There's a cause to shave your head and, you know, be a real agent of change. We want to enlist people in this. Because liberty is right. And in the end, this is going to make our argument win. Unless we sabotage it, unless we do something very wrong, we are going to...